Uh, this panel is uh, the panel of the Victims' Rights Working Group, which is a multidisciplinary organization of organizations that got together to ensure that victims' rights and optimal care uh, are
Back and shoves us under a, a thin mattress that we had been sleeping on. After a moment, we hear a voice say, is there anyone there? We are here to help. Please come out. My mother asks them if they're really there to help. They say they're the good guys. We come out and walk towards the door. My mother carries my two little cousins and my sister. My aunt is crawling, on, crawling behind them. Just then, I see two armed men in the doorway, and something tells me that there is danger. I start running in the other direction. I hear one say, shoot them. As I look back, I see sparks going through my mother and everyone around her. I go back to my hiding place under the thin mattress. I shut my eyes and I start to pray. I can hear the killers singing hymns, praising God for finally letting them have their way with us. Drowning out the songs of the killers are the screams of people being shot and beaten to death. Then I feel something hot drop on my leg. I open my eyes and the whole tent is on fire. Everything around me is melting. I see people with guns running around, stealing suitcases, grabbing anything that looks valuable. Into the distance, I see people set on fire. I hear children crying with no one to hold them. I throw off the mattress and I start to run, but a man with a gun grabs me. He looks like he's about 20 years old. I say, forgive me. I don't know if I'm speaking to him or to God, because as far as we're both concerned, this was the end, whether I died or not. 166 people Mostly children were slaughtered and hundreds of others wounded. Some were killed after their heads were smashed. Others were burned alive. Some were killed by machetes and some were shot. Parents were killed as they tried to shield their children. Babies were left to burn after their mothers had been shot and bled to death. Among those killed were my younger sister, Deborah, my aunt and my cousins. I lost many childhood friends that night. These victims were solely targeted and savagely killed simply because they were Banyu Mulenge Tutsis. Agaton Gwasa acknowledged the responsibility of this crime, yet he lives a life of luxury when we, the victims, live one filled with nightmares. 
See, I did not die that night, and that is something to be thankful for, but the memories and the scars did not die either. For me, there's not a day that goes by where the faces, voices, and screams from that night do not, do not haunt me. My body has been resettled, but my mind is still fighting a war. Survivors like me are often resettled and forgotten when that should be the time where we are most cared for. There's nothing like relieving traumatic experiences in a foreign land where you don't even know how to ask for help. Believe me, I know. Mental illness is common after these sort of tragedies, but unfortunately, survivors are neglected to deal with it on their own after they have been resettled. Living holistic lives becomes nearly impossible. Of course, nothing can bring back the lives of family and friends that were lost that night. But every day that goes by, when criminals like Agaton Grasta are free, reminds me what very little meaning our lives as victims have to the international community. <clears throat> we cannot keep telling stories and hope history does not repeat itself. The international community must prove my words are not only worthy of empathy, but also accountability. Leaders like you and the countries you represent must show me and my family and others that we are not disp disposable. The only way to do that is by bringing people like Agaton Grasa to justice. Only then will war criminals know that their crimes are wrong and that they will not go unpunished. Few cases that the trust fund for victims can can be for, and uh, I don't have enough words to say how much we need to to support the trust fund for victims more to be able to do just that. So that's one aspect in terms of the process. Sandra, I, we are all with you in terms of hearing your heart. I hope you know. regarding an ICC case. The imperative 
mentioned by Wanda Akin and Raymond Brown of the International Justice Process, who are also gracing us with their presence here. Thank you for being here. Go ahead, Mohammed. Thank you very much. And thank you all of you, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you for the International Justice Project to give me this opportunity to speak here today. And thank you, everyone here on the panel, in sharing the stories and the perspective. I thank you, Venezuela, and the Victim Rights Working Group for hosting the panel and discussion. My name is Muhammad Ebay. Oh, I missed. Sorry. It's okay. My name is Muhammad Ebay. I was born in 1975 a small city in North Darfur called Kutum. And I'm a genocide survivor. In 2002, after I studied for four years at al Jazeera University to be an agricultural engineer, I was denied my degree because I refused to serve the Sudan government militia. South Sudan at that time is part of the Sudan. And I believe and I want to fight my people. Like I'm against Sudanese fighting Sudanese. For that, they denied my diploma. And I went back home to Kutum. After a year later, the war in Darfur is started. That's in 2003. At that time, the rebel group fighting with the Sudan government and the, Sudan, the government targeting the young and educated non-Arab African tribes like Zagawa, Four, Mesali. I was a volunteer teacher in uh, North Darfur capital, Al Fashor, when I was arrested and tortured by Sudan government security forces for four years, uh, for, I mean for four months. I escaped back to hometown Kutum. And a month later, the Genjeweed attacked the city city of Kutum. At that attack, they killed 45 innocent people in the city, including my best friend and the imam of the mosque. It was that time, 2004. I am here today representing many Darfuris who have lost their life in the ongoing genocide in Darfur, in the camp of the refugees and internally displaced person of the Darfuris, they are mothers who were raped in front of their children and husbands raped by the government soldiers after the rapes. Those mothers were forced to watch their daughters rape and the husbands killed. There are a thousand, thousand of Darfuri children living in refugee camps and in IDB camps. Do not remember where they are from. There is thousands of Sudanese children living around the world who have never seen Sudan. They are losing, losing to be a Sudanese. We are losing our future. We need you to deliver justice so we can rebuild our life. Therefore, it's longest genocide in the history. And we are still waiting for your 
stop for you to stop Al Bashir. Since he is free, Al Bashir expanded his uh, a genocide campaign to the other marginalized area in South Kurdufan, Blue Nile, and Abiyye. The genocide in Darfur is still happening. It's never stopped. Six months ago, I meet with some of you here, and I tell you and I share you my personal story. And some of you, they cry at that time and tell me, we not let you down. But I'm here to ask you again today, what you have you done? What have you done? And what was the action since the last time that you saw me? Why the ICC give the, uh, why the, why give the ICC power to issue arrest warranty, but then no power to enforce the arrest warranty? Why there are no penalty for the state that's failed to arrest him, al-Bashir. We need more situation like Nigeria, where al-Bashir was afraid that he was going to be arrested. And he just ran away. We need you to put more pressure on him. We need the African Union to support the ICC The African state, Paris, will cooperate with ICC and not welcoming Al-Bashir. What does victim accept from ICC as recognized victims? What, when, when a victim comes to you and tell and share the stories, the personal stories, it's always painful, like what we heard here today from the young lady. It is because the promise you got to get and punish the perpetrator. We trust you. This is only reason to be witness. Don't only speak with us when you went to our testimony. The court should stay engaged we are witness and can help you with your case. We want help. And we also want you to meet with us, not only use us. We ask the court are sup supposed to help us. How are you feeling your obligation to us? Also, you need to protect victims. So when someone like Kenyatta showing up to the ICC, victims can finally get the justice. When we therefore is victim attend the meeting in UN, like what happened uh, on 10th, I attend the meeting, where the, the mom, the, they remember the old genocide like what happened in Rwanda and other places. Mm -hmm. But the people forget about what happened in Darfur and is still going on in Darfur and in Sudan. So almost now, 10 years ago, the UN Security Council referred the situation of Darfur to International Criminal Court. We need to do more to arrest al-Bashir and sent a clear message that tell you stop genocide while it's happening, not apologizing to us. We need the UN to confirm the lies of the UNAMED and DBKO, Department of Peacekeeping Operation. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you had a 200 women when women and girls in Tabit with not having been recently raped on October 31st. We need the truth 
to be told. So the UN Security Council can make a decision based on truth report. So far, the UNAMED has failed their mission to protect the civilian in Sudan, in Darfur particularly, and failed to protect even themselves. UNAMED, we need to be issued the UNAMED to be uh, defended and fix it so they can do better job. If they leave the Sudan, I heard some people, they ask him to, ask the UNAMED to leave the Sudan, it's leave Darfur. If they leave the Darfur and leave the Sudan, they give al-Bashir free hand to do whatever he wants to do. And at that time, we have a question, who protect my people? Every time when I call families and members in refugee camps and IDP camps, the elders, they always tell me, listen, my son, do something. We're waiting for you to do something. So that's why I'm here, to ask you to do something to protect those people who are waiting almost 12 years in the camps in the middle of the desert in North Chad and IDP camps, I mean refugee camps in North, Dar North Chad and IDP camps in Sudan and they just attacked by Sudan militia, Sudan government. So I'm here today, I have a dream. My dream, Omar al-Bashir living in a small jail in Hague and you and I together stop the suffering in Sudan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mohammed, very much for giving us another chance and speaking to us again. Uh, victims, no matter how we disappoint them, they still trust us to to keep going and be there for them and not stop our own effort. I think, again, I would like to, to reflect a little bit from the perspective of reparative justice on what Mohammed was saying. He said, when we are waiting, be there for us. Uh, I think the part of the registrar's revision uh, the purpose of being on the ground is perhaps would afford victims at least a sense of ongoing engagement and knowing that they're not just abandoned and forgotten. Uh, and again, in terms of reparative justice, the, the words like outreach that the court use, uses may perhaps be better reflecting victims' requests if we call it presence. So it's not that we are in The Hague reaching out to them somewhere, but we're present where they are with them. So uh, I would like the audience to reflect on that as, as well. Um, of course, protection issues are abandoned, and I'm sure you will speak to that uh, as well. Uh, and of course, we speak about both physical and psychological protection. And we can talk about that later. Uh, let's move on to uh, Mr. Fidel Zita. in the DRC, in the Katanga, and good, good, I never can pronounce it, Gudolo case. case. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, 
I thank you, Yael, for giving me the floor. It was asked of me to talk to you about my experience concerning the participation of victims before the ICC. And I was asked to stress my intervention on a reparative approach of justice on the point of view of the victims. Before I start my presentation, I would like to thank the organizations to share with you and to stress that in all the meetings that I have assisted in the meetings before the ICC, it has always been reminded that the biggest innovation at, before the ICC or the Rome Statute is to allow the victims to participate to the trial and the possibility for the victims to obtain reparation. During this afternoon, the question of reparative justice will come often, and I will share with you the experience I'm living because in the cases I'm intervening in, one of them concerns Jermaine Katanga, the first trial chamber um, asked the, the GREF to consult the, the victims in collaboration with the legal representation of the victims during last month. And so I have a lot of elements to share with you concerning the victims, the victims' expectations in terms of reparation. For a good comprehension of the cases, I would like to make a brief presentation of the case, of the cases of the victims I represent during the trial. There are 364 victims invited to participate, and they are in two groups. The first group concerning women, children that were victims of the crimes committed in the concerned village, and the other group, the ex-child soldiers that were also victims. The crimes concerned the in a, the crimes concerned those concerning those victims happened in a particular locality. Two hundred civilians were killed. The village was pillaged and um, destro destroyed. The women were raped, kidnapped, and taken as slave prisoners by the assailants. Initially, the accused were persecuted together jointly, but in November 2012, for technical reasons, the judges decided to sever the two accused. For Ngunjolo, the judgment in December 2012, the prosecution went on appeal. They pleaded in before the, the appeal court, and they're still waiting for the verdict. Concerning Mr. Katanga, as it was repeated several times, he was condemned to 12 years in prison. And, don't, and so the, the trial is over. That's why there is a reparation phase going on, the participation of victims. Satisfied or not? My answer is to say yes and no. 
Now I'm talking in terms of trial because the participation of the, in the trial is also a reparation proce proceeding. The fact for the victims to, to tell what they lived in the form with the idea of that the, the story that they just wrote on this piece of paper will get to the judge and that the judge will know about it is a huge relief and a beginning of acknowledgement and a valorization that the victims retrieve by making this. And this is the reason why they participate. During the whole trial, the victims came all to the gatherings to be informed of the advancement of the proceedings to give their opinion and share their preoccupation and participate entirely in the debate that was taking place as a legal representative. I did not, I tried to not make it superficial, so I tried to associate the victims to all what was going on in the trial. I was receiving their instructions. I, I always asked for their opinions regarding the arguments of the prosecution as well. Uh, yeah. According to what they said, I juridically, legally, a, made a, a defense, a strategic defense, so that their preoccupation would be heard by the judge. And that had a lot of consequences. The contrary, we would have provoked a feeling of revictimization because they were not heard, they were not taken into consideration. Before the second chamber, trial chamber, the victims were allowed to participate to all the proceedings. They had the right to make preliminary declarations, cross-examining the witnesses, to make testimonies before the court. They were allowed to consult all the proceedings, all the documents of the dossier. All that allowed the victims to contribute to the debate for the manifestation of the truth. It also happened that the point of view of the victims were considered as a third way. When the prosecutors, as the defense, did not agree, the intervention of victims helped the judge as a third way to try to understand the context of the allegations that were debated. The defense or the representation of an important group of victims is not always an easy task. It needs methodology. We have to be at the disposition of all victims, listen to them, hear them. And it was asked of me one day, Are you sure that you have met all the victims that you are representing? As I have just told you, 
we just for six weeks we have we have met each victims and each victim has been able to tell his story and uh, his expectations of the reparation. So in regard to the expectations of victims, to justice in general, to what is going on in the court, two main points. The first one is the determination of the culprit, of the person responsible. And the second one is to obtain reparation of the prejudice suffered. In, in dealing with the first point, when I say that the victims were satisfied, yes, but also no, as was Sarah the saying, the condemnation, the prosecution of the responsible are very important for the victims. In our case, or in my cases, Ngonjolo was acquitted, and that created, on the part of the victims, an awe when they were informed by the judgment, they were, they started crying. The victims were started crying. It was very difficult to try to console them after an acquittal because for them there were no doubts. And he was acquitted because the prosecutor could not prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the proofs were sufficient before the court. Concerning Germain Katanga, the fact that he was condemned and s convicted of 12, 12 years in prison, we had to explain to the victims that he was condemned to only 12 years and as he had already undergone a great deal of his of his um, sentence, the victims were in a situation of re-victimization because they were not satisfied by the decisions that were rendered by the court. I am not attacking the judgment. I'm talking in terms of, of the victims that do not know all the technical proceedings and that do not understand why the judge arrived to this conclusion. All Although we explained to them her, their expectations were disappointed in terms of this judgment. Right now their preoccupation is that the real, the real culprit will be brought to justice. Concerning their expectations in terms of reparation, We obtained with the office, we proposed um, alternative measures. For what the victims want, what is most flagrant. Unfortunately, I have to stop, but what is most flagrant on part of the victims? the crime that they have suffered, impoverished them. They are living in displaced camps and they hope to obtain, obtain the help of the, the help to restore their dignity. Now they're talking, they're trying to survive in different camps, in different localities, and they're trying to survive. 
and what they want in terms of reparation. They want the, the court to help them to restore their dignity, help them put their child in school, help them retrieve activities that can help them live. I'm going to stop there because the time I have has been <laughs> overused. I'm, I am at everybody's disposition for any questions. Thank you very much, Fidel. You gave us a great deal of material for thought. Uh, and I think there will have to be a lot of wisdom developed by the ICC in terms of comprehending what victims mean by being disappointed, what they really mean by when we say victims' expectations, and how do we reasonably and humanely engage ourselves with that, uh, independent of the court decisions. Uh, so that, that, that is a whole other seminar, but uh, I think it's very crucial for us to think about. Uh, so it, 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 of course, philosophically, it's the question of the meaning of justice and the expectations for the meaning of justice. I, I would like to now call on our next speaker, Mr. Ali Katara, chairperson of the Ivorian Coalition for the ICC. Uh, he's uh, dealing with the ICC investigations over a situation under, under trial and will address the views and concerns of the victims to continue our topic. Thank you, Ali. Thank you. I would like to thank the organizations for inviting me. We're going to start directly to the subject. The Statute of Rome has advanced the rights of victims suffering international crimes to participate according to Article 68 of the Rome Statute. For us and for the whole world, a huge accomplishment in the international justice system, the victims can participate. They are the right to, to participate. And they have the right to protect of protection and reparation, reparative justice. That is our current subject, is at a phase, a symbolical phase in Ivory Coast because no trials have happened for Ivory Coast suspects after the opening of trial uh, of inquiries by the, pro the prosecutor. We are going to concentrate our presentation on the court's work in um, Ivory Coast and also the NGOs and the Ivory Coast government. Reparation for us is moral. Reparation is at this stage psychological, reparation is symbolical, and often medical. In the ICC, since the first arrest mandate um, for Ivory Coast citizens, a work of campaign outreach is happening with the office close to the Ivory Coast victims. This work has given hope to the victims, moral support, 
and psychological support. The opening of the local bureau at, in Abidjan is an important step in sustaining the justice for victims of, in Ivory Coast. It's also to orient them, guide them, and to be their voice before the ICC. This work has allowed to heal the wounds on a moral ground, on a psychological ground, giving a symbolical reparation. And this outreach is necessary to the survival of those victims. However, it's good to stress that the proceedings are not concerning all the victims of the Ivory Coast crimes, and that creates frustrations on some levels. This dynamic has allowed many associations of victims to happen in Ivory Coast, the victims' participations in proceedings and the nomination of the legal representatives of the victims, Paulina Matida, is, a, is an important element in the psychological and moral reparation of the victims. The victims don't feel alone anymore. They, are, they don't feel abandoned anymore because they have someone to speak to at the court. It's a first victory for the Ivory Coast victims. Also, the fact that they know of the existence of the Victims Trust Fund constitutes a comfort and a moral justice for the victims. As far as Ivory Coast NGOs, it's a work that has started since Ivory Coast recognized the jurisdictional competence of the court. It's a work of formation, of education, the sensitization, but also of legal representation, psychological and medical, that is daily carried out by the NGOs in Ivory Coast. Clinical legal clinics have happened throughout all Ivory Coast. The NGOs have constituted for certain victims an intermediary whose voices is a vector of the first comfort and the first reparation in terms of psychological healing. The NGOs are before and after during all the proceedings. They are the essential chain for the victims. For the Ivory Coast governments, a lot of things happened for reparative justice. First of all, the creation of bureaus for the victims that became the Ministry of Solidarity. Also, it's the organization and recognition of the Association of Victims, the commemoration of the National Day of Solidarity for the Ivory Coast victims. Also, the symbolical acts towards certain victims and the trust fund for victims that was just created by the Ivory Coast government and that will be operational starting in 2015. In conclusion, we can say that the reparative justice in Ivory Coast it, uh, is at a liminary stage. 
We need more will and more engagement. On the one hand, with the NGOs, the Ivory Coast governments, and on the other hand, by the court to make it more effective. The civil society will have to stay as a credible intermediary in the outreach they provide. A recommendation for the court is that the court will have to initiate projects of rehabilitation in Ivory Coast and re-socializations in profit of the victims. The Ivory Coast government will have to start projects of rehabilitation of the memory of the victims either by individual reparations or collective reparations such as monuments to attain those objectives the ICC will have to accelerate the organization of the trials take into account all the victims in cases and situations and render operational the trust fund for victims as far as Ivory Coast is concerned Ivory Coast will have to adopt a law, an implementation law, that will allow a rep reparation for all the victims. This implementation law is indispensable for the protection and the psychological support and moral support of all the victims. I thank you. Thank you very much, Ali, for your comprehensive presentation and multidimensional and multidisciplinary one, which is refreshing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have to acknowledge uh, that you're talking about future hopes and future plans, and we will be with you in implementing these, these hopes. Um, Again, I don't want to take more time to, take, to show how it applies to reparative justice because it's not the main focus, although it's the framework we are talking about. Uh, I, uh, our next speaker, uh, Ms. Juliette Mambo Mohol, who is a member of parliament from the Democratic Republic of the Congo and member of the Parliamentarians for Global Actions couldn't uh, attend, unfortunately. And David uh, Donatatin, who is the uh, Secretary General of PGA, will make uh, some comments on her behalf. I would like to take this moment to express uh, our great gratitude, profound gratitude for PGA for taking so much care of the, all of the technical details and making possible the, uh, the uh, occurrence of this meeting. Really tireless workers with attending to every little issue. Uh, thank you, David. It should be absolutely acknowledged, as well as the support uh, of all the members of the Victims' Rights Working Group. But really, PGI has been outstanding and great colleagues. Go ahead, David. Thank you, Yael. And um, we are very sorry that uh, our um, treasurer of the PGA Congolese group, uh, <coughs> Juliet, who addressed the plenary of the last ASP in The Hague, could not uh, be with us. Juliette Mpampu is a woman MP from North Kivu who created a small uh, family foundation to help women victims of sexual and gender-based violence. In doing so, she's collecting help that she can find uh, from various sources and trying to give uh, relief and assistance, uh, a, mod a mode of rehabilitation for those in need uh, from her uh, constituency. This is not uncommon in the Parliamentarians for Global Action membership. 
um, our president recently elected, she herself is a victim of crimes against humanity given, given that her mother and the sisters of her mother and her father were all killed by the military junta in uh, the Dominican Republic in the 1960s. Um, the uh, idea that justice must, must be reparative uh, for the victims is, vi is felt very strongly by the membership of Parliamentarians for Global Action. Just last Friday in the Parliament of Morocco in Rabat, the PGA Congolese National Group presented a very strong statement uh, that called for the fulfillment of the responsibility of states and of the International Criminal Court to provide access to justice, access to the truth, and access to reparations to the victims of the core crimes under the jurisdiction of the court. As uh, Ali uh, correctly said, there is a very important role to play for uh, member states, and uh, it's not by coincidence that the president of the assembly just uh, uh, reached us at this stage of the, of the debate. <coughs> To close, I just want to acknowledge that this is really a teamwork without the support from the International Justice Project and Avocats Sans Frontières and all the members of the Victims' Rights Working Group. We will not be there. And for parliamentarians, it is absolutely crucial to take the angle of the victim's perspective because justice is not a priority from, for one side or another side of the political spectrum. Justice is an imperative for the service of the victims and the in fulfillment of the rights of the victims. Too often during, during this Assembly of State Parties, we have listened to the uh, distinguished approach, the rights of the accused and the interests of the victims. Uh, the jurisprudence of the court testifies that also uh, victims' positions are protected by rights. They are rights bearers, and we are here to try to serve their best interest. Thank you very much. Before I uh, give the floor to the registrar and then happily to the president, I also happily for the registrar, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, I would like to, to add another dimension of reparative justice that is rarely addressed and uh, should be emphasized, which is the cost incurred, emotional costs and other costs by not only the victims, but the interveners and all professionals that interface with victims and with their stories. And the need for not just specialized training, but need for support uh, for all professionals on, a co on an ongoing basis. Uh, and that goes to any staffer in the court, from interpreters to judges, uh, to the prosecutor, to everyone, uh, and to the intermediaries. I know that when Fidel was talking, he had a lot of feelings about disappointing the victims <laughs> as the representative of the disappointing court, for example. On the other hand, I think our commitment to this work and the passion of our commitment to this work uh, keeps us feeling okay about living in this world. At least we are on the side of right. And uh, please, Herman. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Yael, and, and thanks for the, the invitation to participate in, in this afternoon society event organized at the Victims' Rights uh, Working Group. Um, I think it's a great pleasure for me to be uh, here. Um, but also, I think if, if I've listened to the um, uh, the speakers before, if I listen to the story that Sandra uh, started off with and the story from Mohammed, um, it makes you realize what an enormous burden, what an enormous responsibility there is on the court in order to properly and effectively deal with victims. Um, it makes you feel humble, but it also sometimes makes you uh, despair that you can never do it right and you can never do enough in order to really reach out to victims. Um, I think that is an incredible burden. If I just look at a number of requests that were addressed to the court, um, the arrest of Mr. Bashir, um, and of course I'm not contradicting that quite to the contrary, we have been pushing for that for years, and unfortunately so far that has been seriously 
uh, ineffective. Um, the request for reparation, the, the request for a better um, representation, a better voice of victims in the proceedings. Um, these are incredibly strong statements. These are uh, statements that the court has to listen to, and that's, for, that's also why I was so happy to be here, because I was able to listen to those stories. But again, as I said, it makes it incredibly uh, challenging to meet the needs, to meet the uh, requirements, and uh, to meet, as, as Mohammed said, the dreams that he has um, as to what the court can do for victims, whether it is in Sudan, uh, whether it is in, in Cote d'Ivoire, where I had the opportunity a few weeks ago to meet with Ali Uttara uh, and with many other civil society organizations there, and to hear also their requests, their preoccupations in the country there. Um, the, from that perspective, um, you sometimes feel that the court can <coughs> never do it right. Uh, and I'm not sure whether that is a positive or a negative conclusion. It's probably an element of realism. Uh, but at the same time, also, it means that we have to do our uttermost to do the maximum possible for victims. Um, the Rome Statute creates a very strong obligation on the institution to deal with victims. Um, not only by legal representation in proceedings, but also by its creation within the Rome Statute framework of the Trust Fund for Victims. And it's very happy to see, of course, here, and the president of the board uh, of the Trust Fund for Victims and the executive director, uh, that they are with the court and I am with them in terms of giving a voice to victims um, in the entire Rome Statute framework. Um, from that perspective, uh, and if you, if you move away from those personal stories, it almost sounds trivial uh, to go into issues of organization within the court, but at the same time, I think it is an absolutely important aspect to touch upon. Um, and you, you already briefly referred to the revision project within uh, the registry um, and actually within the wider context of, of the court. Um, it is spreading throughout the, the court and I think there's a wide recognition within the court that we have to be effective and efficient as possible not in relation to victims only, but in relation to our entire work. Um, and also in my, um, inter, uh, of, in my exchanges with the new president of the Assembly of States Parties, we have already touched upon the necessity to ensure an effective operations of the court. Uh, but turning back to the victim participation, as you may know, um, and I've had the pleasure earlier this week to discuss with a number of NGOs, and I will continue that discussion, um, I'm in a process of a revision for the registry. Um, and one of the crucial elements there is also um, the proposal to create, um, rather than having various sections at the moment fo uh, focusing on victim participation, to put it all in one strong victim's office in order to ensure that we can do more, that we can do better than what we do now. Um, as long as I hear the word disappointment, and I heard it this afternoon, I think there's an obligation for us to critically think about what we can do in order to do things in a better way. But that is a big picture question, and I think in the discussions that I have had, I sometimes hear issues about detail as to how to organize this exactly, how to organize that exactly. That is important, but I think the bigger picture question is a very important one, and that is that we can do better than we have done so far. Um, yes, we are a young institution, uh, but uh, victims can't wait until we have matured. Victims are demanding justice today and have been demanding over the last years, and we have to take that demand very serious. Um, so I, I really, through this, uh, with this opportunity also appeal again to really think with me on how to further improve, how to further strengthen the Rome Statute system in terms of victim participation, what the future victim office can do, uh, what, legal, what the role of legal representatives can be, uh, how we can better service legal representatives, how we can better um, listen to the voices of victims. Um, one other part of the revision, team, uh, revision project uh, is to strengthen the presence in the field. Um, mm -hmm. Frankly speaking, 
I feel that the court has been too much centered on what is happening in The Hague. Uh, and has not been focusing sufficiently on what is actually the voice of victims, the voice of people in the countries where the court is doing investigations. Part of the revision project is to change that, is to actually take positions away from The Hague and bring them to the field to strengthen our presence in the field, to ensure, and, and Ali confirmed, it was a very important message in Côte d'Ivoire, in Abidjan, that there was an office of the uh, ICC that was opened there. We have to strengthen that office, not only there, but also in other countries. It is part of a bigger picture. There's a long way to go. Um, and I'm afraid that in the future, we may still he hear the word disappointment. Um, but you can rest assured that everything that I will do in my term as, as registrar is focused on uh, maximizing the capacity of the court to reach out to victims, make their uh, voice heard, and make sure that victims do feel that by the end of the day, the work of the court has addressed their concerns and that justice has been delivered to them. Uh, again, that is not something that the court can do on its own. That obligation, that burden is too big. We have to work together with others. Um, Ali, one of his recommendations was also that the government of Côte d'Ivoire itself has to focus on issues of reparation. I think that applies to every single country where crimes have been committed. The court can do its role, but the court can't do it on its own. States have to work um, there as well. NGOs have to work there. Uh, let's all join forces in that respect in order to maximize the impact on our victims. I think I would like to leave it by this. And again, thanks very much for this opportunity uh, to hear the voice of the victims today. Thank you. Thank you, Herman. May I just uh, take one second to acknowledge that one of the principles of reparative justice is that of coherence. And uh, indeed, in the revision project, uh, there the, the, the are direction, uh, the, there's work in that direction, which is very uh, optimistic for me. Um, and of course, uh, the complementarity principles should bring everything we learn to national jurisdictions. So everything we are learning here, including of reparative justice, should go not just to the ICC, but to the ICC as a beacon of how to create, how to make justice meaningful in the world. So I, that is so very important. Uh, with a great uh, pleasure. We are graced by our new uh, ASP president. <laughs> president Kama, <Kammer>, please. <laughs> we, are, we are looking forward to your comments. I would like to say that it's a huge pleasure to attend this meeting because the theme dealt with is fundamental. The participation of victims, the right of victims, is one of the major accomplishments of the international justice system. That in the Rome Statute, we could have taken this fundamental data. It will have meant that a justice without victims, it's an unjust in injustice because it is not a sustainable justice. It will have not listened to the voice of suffering. It will have not listened to the voice of hurt. The criminal trial in its finality has three objectives. First of all, it has a preventive mission by the existence of the law. that everyone 
knows that they can be prosecuted, whether they are heads of states, military he chiefs, political heads, the equality of prosecutions. This prevention is enhanced by the Nuremberg message because in Nuremberg we have witnessed that we cannot invoke a, an official status to for that person to be subtracted to justice. The second element is the dissuasive mission. The dissuasive mission is the utilization of justice to condemn the authors of the most heinous crimes. Once indicted, the message is given to those who kill, assassin, torture, that they will be prosecuted and punished. And this message is very important because it means that no one has the right to kill in all impunity. The third fundamental point is the educational message. The educational message is addressed to the victims, the victims who have seen those who have heard them before the justice system. Let's say that fear has changed camps. They are no longer scared because they know that justice is there to sanction the behavior contrary to what is expected from a head of state, for instance. And in 98, when there were negotiations, the preoccupation was exactly that. Because by experience, we have seen that international justice had one preoccupation. It was before and foremost to sanction before anything else the those responsible. We have seen this experience with what happened with ICE, with the ad hoc tribunal for ex Yugoslavia. We also seen this experience for the ad hoc tribunal for Rwanda. And in the Rwandan case, when we left with the NGOs that were present, analyzing the situation in Arusha, where the tribunal was, the victims had the feeling of something that wasn't done and that the res those responsible of the genocide were condemned, but there was no reparation. And reparation is a fundamental element. That's why when there's a crisis, when there is a civil war, when there is a dictatorship, and that we want to bring back peace on the basis of a construction of the rule of law, we have thought of the transitional justice. That is one aspect, a fundamental aspect of taking into account the situation of victims. And four fundamental pillars are stressed. The right of the victims, to the truth, to know why the, why the crime, why be inflicted this hurt, why did he do it, 
to ask the one to explain himself the right of justice to know that this right is a fundamental right and that justice will take care of those who commit those crimes. The third pillar is the right to reparation. Reparation is individual. It can also be collective. When it's a community, when it's a race, when it's a nationality, when it's all a region that they have tried to massacre. It can take the form of a pecuniary reparation, but also the moral reparation. When we give a memorial to a situation to try to resolve what happened. It could also be for the kids who have lost their father, lost their mother, to have the possibility to have a chance of a future because the father, the mother are no longer here. Give them the possibility of have a, to have a scholarship so that can have, they can have an equitable future. The fourth pillar is the right to non the right of non-repetition, stressing the rule of law. The rule of law based with a, on independent justice, an impartial justice that can judge without hate and impartiality because vengeance is not the act of justice. And that will prepare a, re a so reconciliative society. It is possible because we have taken into account the rights of the victims, and that is important. In all societies, this preoccupation is paramount. My friend Ali Ouattara, two years ago, we were in Yamoussoukro. It's the Ivory Coast situation. We have to ask ourselves, it was the title of the international conference of, organized by the United Nations, how to have an equitable justice in Ivory Coast. The central point we insisted is the right of victims, is the fundamental element. And we should continually have that in mind. Just before I took ministerial functions, one and a half years ago, I was in Guinea as a, an attorney to the victims for the tragedy that occurred in 2009, in 2008, where women had been violenced and were victims of sexual acts and sexual crimes. We had to find a solution. When the United Nations sent a mission, the national justice, that's when the complementarity principle plays. The national justice system seized itself of this question so that the rights of victims could be taken into account, the victims were, were associated, so that they had more chances instead of being alone. They organized themselves in associations. And we provided attorneys for them. And we prepared their case that allowed to have power, a power struggle. And they were heard. Consequently, the men that were untouchable in Guinea were arrested. People at ministerial positions, government officials were arrested. And this is a victory. And tomorrow this process, this trial will be, will happen. And when they will be condemned, there will also be the possibility to condemn them on their, what they, be, they have, their belongings their assets. I would like to tell you about an experience I had in my country, the case Abre. 
the Abre case was president, the Chad president, from the from June seventh, nineteen eighty-two, to December first, nineteen ninety. The National Commission that was created in nineteen ninety-two thought that during the eighth years of his mandate, there were forty thousand cases of assassinations and several and cases of torture and dis and disappearances. It was difficult for the victims to have justice in their countries. They came to Senegal, and the state of Senegal that ratified the the Rome's that ratified the Convention Against Torture of 1984, Senegal ratified it in 1987, accepted that those victims could see their rights to justice and to reparation in Senegal. And so the trial is in course, instruction will finish January 31st. It's possible that the judge the decides because there was an agreement between the African Union and the state of Senegal, an agreement that allowed the, the ad hoc chambers. Human Rights Watch, AFIDH, also, organizations from Chad, African organizations helping the victims, those organizations were allowed to create that power struggle. That's why the victims can be heard in Senegal. If justice has to be rendered, this is an important step to know that justice is rendered. And the other important case is in Ivory Coast, this pr procedure has to come to fruition. The last experience I would like to share with you is an, uh, an organization I created in 1999, Africa Center for the Prevention of Conflicts. We were three friends. From We started from a clear idea one is a university professor, the other one is a, is a doctor, and the other one an attorney. Evaluating the situations of the victims, what should we do? We said, first thing, we have to insist for prevention so there would be no crisis. But if the crisis happen, what should we do? When people have been tortured, killed, we would have to in this moment that the victims would be able to be rehabilitated on a medical point of view and a social point of view. All this was important. After that, insist on the fact that there is a trial, the right of justice, the right of reparation. You are, you are right. Those who fight to act, have access to justice, have access to the law, have access to reparation, is the conditions of peace. Justice and peace go hand in hand. When victims are appeased, because the feelings that can be stemmed from vengeance will be, they will be reconciled. This is the fundamental element for a society of peace where men, reconciled men, and last so that we can get away from a society of arbitrary, of violence, and that far away from those who violate rights. I have to leave because they are waiting for me. I encourage you, I felicitate you. This is, a com this is a fight for truth to win against tyranny. Thank you.
as I said, there's a lot of passion for justice around. And I think that's what keeps us going, ultimately. Uh, because part of what I worry about is when victims don't get their hopes fulfilled and when they feel disappointed, sometimes they go and blame themselves for it, which makes their lives even more tormenting. Like it's their role to do this. So we have to, to, we have to help them in that too. Uh, to, to, I don't want to be remiss and not acknowledge the pro bono interpreters we have uh, from PGA and from Redress. <laughs> and we, then we don't have to worry that they're going to leave us, you see, because they're with us. <laughs> uh, I, I, as chair, I, there's so much more to discuss. And this is one event in a process, and I hope we will have chance to discuss the meaning of reparative justice onward in relation with the court. But I promised as chair to call on uh, one of the key people for this uh, notion, uh, Peter Deban, the executive director of the trust fund. Would you want to say a few words? Okay. Uh, Mr. Deban asked you, uh, <laughs> Chairman of the Board, to take the floor in, in the stead. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chair. Um, yes, uh, this uh, seminar renewed my sense of uh, how, uh, how uh, much uh, we have uh, things to do. Uh, of course, uh, what the court and the uh, trust fund for victims can do is very limited, uh, but uh, the speakers' uh, voices have uh, uh, really uh, sounded as an uh, encouraging message, message in one sense. Uh, on the other hand, it's a kind of daunting message for us, uh, uh, considering the fact uh, that we have a lot more to do. Uh, what what uh, is uh, very clear from uh, uh, this message is the court uh, and uh, the trust fund for victims have to uh, keep working together very closely in many aspects. Uh, of course, uh, I have been discussing this uh, uh, very frequently and in depth with the registrar and uh, other uh, parts of the uh, court, especially when the uh, reparations orders are uh, issued uh, by the appeals chamber, uh, hopefully in, in a few months' time, uh, there will be more uh, need for us to uh, further uh, cooperate with uh, the uh, chambers. Uh, of, of course, uh, there are some kind of uh, uh, role sharing and different responsibilities and mandates uh, among the organs uh, of the court and the TFB, but from the eyes of the victims, uh, we are together uh, in international criminal court, uh, which is supposed to provide uh, redress to uh, uh, those victims of the most serious international crimes. Uh, so uh, thank you very much uh, for our speakers and to, uh, in reminding us of our uh, tasks uh, that we have to achieve uh, hopefully uh, gradually, but uh, uh, without uh, uh, further uh, making them uh, waiting, uh, because they have already been waiting for many years. Thank you very much. I also uh, uh, promised last week for the Kenyan victims, if they want to make a statement, I think they have their own session, so they might, they might not have taken us up on the invitation. 
Uh, I just wanted to check. Uh, are there any, we have probably time for one and a half questions or comments uh, of a minute each. Is anyone, go ahead, uh, please introduce yourself. I'm uh, from Darfur. Uh, my question is, how long are we going to wait for this? Uh, my mother is in the refugee camp. He lost his son, and my brother's wife was eight months pregnant. And my brother's son was 13 years old, and I lost a lot of, of my relatives, a lot of them including my brother, my brother's wife, my brother's son. And my mother was in refugee camp for years. And in Darfur, in IDB camp or in the refugee camp or in the neighbor countries, people, they are living on, on the desert, living in the hope for justice. They're dreaming tomorrow is going to be a better day, but it's going to be worse because more 10 or 20, 40,000 people coming every month from different villages and different places. For how long are we going to be we go, For how long are we going to wait this? It's been over 10 years. All the world leaders, they know this. And shame for UN that they hear what, they, what happened in, in Darfur. What happened recently in Tibet, more than 200 women being raped, some of them are eight years and under. The unit failed to defend for themselves, not even the, uh, the, the civilian. For how long? For how long are we going to wait for justice? If anyone, like President Obama, if his two daughters get raped, he's going to wait for 10 years? I don't think so. I will tell the truth no matter what. They can ship me back to Africa. I'm ready because I lost all, everything. No fear on me. Nothing I can be fear of. I don't have any feeling even because I lost more than 58. How many people you know by first name and last name and middle name? More than 58? A few of them you can count them. But I know more than 58 of my relatives, including my brother, my cousin, I have more than seven brothers and one sister. I'm only one left on the brothers. Some of them, yes, some of them died before their accident. But what's going to happen worse? My question is how long are we going to wait for this? Is there any justice in this world? People went from here to the moon. Yes, they did. But they can't, they find blood. Uh, Bin Laden in somewhere. They find uh, Gaddafi in somewhere. They fight for, for Egypt, and uh, we don't have anything, that's why. When the, the UN failed in Rwanda, failed in Bosnia, failed in Darfur. We, your voice only can be heard. Thank you for international justice. We felt we are not alone. They are always with us. And there is, we're waiting for hope. I don't know for how long. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I believe that, first of all, thank you for sharing this with us. You touched us very deeply. I believe that people in this room not only hear you, but would remember. And they're committed to ensure justice for Darfur and doing so much, but so much more needs to be done. Uh, I think your message should be the message we close with. I want just to connect it to President Kaba's pointing out for the educational function of justice and say, we are teaching, you are teaching us. And we hear you and we will teach what you said to us, to others. And it's part of what we must do. 
Uh, my mother, before she died, asked me once, it was she was dying, she asked Yael, do you really believe that what you do makes any difference? So I thought for a long time. And I said to her, you know, I don't know if it makes a difference. I hope so. But I couldn't not do it anyhow. So maybe that would help you somehow. And feel free to be in touch with us. The Victims' Rights Working Group is exactly the place where people who are concerned with victims, including victims themselves, try to hold these discussions on an ongoing basis. So thank you. I see one legal representative is absolutely urgent. Go ahead. <laughs> but I do think that one of the things those of us who've been around for, first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Raymond Brown. Yes. I'm a legal representative for victims in Darfur and with Wanda Aiken, founder of the International Justice Project. But I was involved with several of the organizations that were at Rome, so I've been here for a long time. And I think what we lose sight of is that I believe that the ICC will be judged success or failure on what it does in Darfur. Um, we were this morning at the Security Council where if you heard the prosecutor begging the Security Council to respond to the eight, li eight letters about cooperation which have been ignored by the Security Council as a body. Um, we know the African Union has come up with a bogus jurisprudence about sitting heads of state, which, by which it's influencing some members even of the Assembly of States parties, and I'm sorry the President left. So it seems to me, and even the revisions and revisions of how the registry works, at the end of the day, Darfur is different. It's a diaspora and population that can fight because unlike every other situation, you have a head of state who's offered to assassinate anyone who participates in the court process. And because of those difficulties and because the genocide continues, this is the case and the situation by which the ICC will be judged. And it's reasonable to say that despite the euphoria that the court's in place and that there is a movement talking about challenge to impunity, the failure to effectively bring Bashir to trial, the failure to use the mechanisms of the court to bring about justice here is the singular instance on which this very young, infant as an international institution will be judged. And so for those of us who care about it, um, we are now at the moment where perhaps in the next one or two years, because I fear that Mr. Bashir has bad health, I want him to live a long time in that cell that Mohammed talked about. And so it seems to me that this court is going to be judged a success or failure by what the trust fund does, by what the court does, and by what the community of nations that are part of the ASB and part of the UN do. And thus far, the score is Mr. Bashir, very big numbers. The ICC family, zero. Thank you. Uh, the, the Victims' Rights Working Group actually has a meeting uh, following this. So those of you who are present, please can, join can, us. Go ahead, Yeah, Bobby. do you allow me to do something? I knew he would I want to close word. in an optimistic view. <laughs> Mr. Bashir, if it was not for the ICC, would be a free president, not indicted for the most serious crimes of international concern. We haven't achieved justice. It's a long path. But at least we cannot say that there is impunity. Because if an, an individual is charged with genocide and crimes against humanity, there is no impunity for that individual. There is not yet justice for the victim. So we are in the middle. Uh, we, are not, we, we don't have to start from zero but we are in the middle of a long path that will be hopefully conducive to, to justice and accountability. Thank you.